the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this new series that we're just starting. Um, and um, I'm so happy that you're, uh, that you're here, and I'm so happy to share <clears throat> this series with you. Um, so um, we're starting uh, this new series, and I'm going to be very honest. It comes uh, from a very contextual place in my life. Um, every now and again, God allows me to, to encounter people who, who ask me questions, deep questions, and, they, and they're not satisfied with superficial answers. And I, I, uh, I, I'm so blessed by that. So recently, um, a couple months ago, a young woman um, who is often here, is not today, but, and so on, anyways, says to me, you know, do we, do we really believe uh, in this idea that, that the, the bread and the wine which are offered in every um, service could actually, could they actually be like the real substantial material body and blood of Jesus? Or is it like symbolic? Or is it memorial? Or is it commemorative? Or is it is it like you, you know we're like um, remembering some kind of like real important thing? And so um, so I shared with her all the answers that I would usually be able to share with somebody. And thank God she wasn't satisfied. So so it sent us on a search. Um, she started digging, and she fires me a text message, and she says to me, do you mean to tell me that all Christians up until after the Protestant Reformation believed this? Is that what is believed and taught in the Orthodox Church? And I said, yes. She said, so the disciples of Jesus believed this. That's what they believed. They what is that what they believed? I replied back, this is all by text. Yes. Right? And she says, and what about their disciples? And I replied back, yes. And I was wondering how many more yeses I was going to say. But I didn't have the evidence to back it up, other than what I've learned, what I've heard, but not what I've read and what I've researched. So this conversation carried on through Christmas, through New Year's, Right, and then shortly after Christmas, as a celebrated uh, uh, on the Julian calendar, as we celebrate it, um, a, a an evangelical church mega church pastor who has written tons of books and is one probably if you only know three or four names in all of evangelicalism and all of like you know in the world round, this would be one of them, Francis Chan preaches his entire sermon in the, the first Sunday of January, or the January 8th or whatever it was, on this topic. And this is what he has to say. This is a three-minute clip. You can watch the 42-minute version, but I just saved you the three-minute the three clip. Taking of the body and blood of Christ somehow in some real way. Again, I'm not making any like grand statements. I'm just saying I some of the stuff I didn't know. I didn't know that for the first fifteen hundred years of church history, everyone saw it as the literal body and blood of Christ. And it wasn't until five hundred years ago that someone popularized the thought that it's just a symbol and nothing more. I didn't know that. Wow, well, that's something to consider. Um, and and I, while I won't make a strong statement, I will make a statement about this. It was at that same time that for the first time, someone put a pulpit in the front of the gathering. Because before that, it was always the body and blood of Christ that was central to your gathering. For 1,500 years, it was never one guy and his pulpit being the center of the church. It was the body and blood of Christ. And even the leaders just saw themselves as partakers 
and all that. We're not worthy, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. I say that because the church is more divided than any time in history. What does this book tell us clearly? That he does not want any divisions in his church. And for a thousand years, there was just one church. You know that? We're so used to growing up in a time when literally there are over 30,000 Christian denominations right now. But for the first thousand years, there was just one. What was interesting is communion was at the center of the room every time they gathered. And it wasn't a pulpit where a guy preached after studying in his office by himself for 20 hours. See, right now we've got guys like me that go in a room, study, you know. That, that's what I was doing for years. Meanwhile, other guys went in their rooms and studied. And then we started all giving different messages, so many contradicting each other. And pretty soon, well, I follow Piper, I follow Chan, I follow, you know, it's just like everyone's following different guys. I'm just saying that I believe there was something about taking communion out of the center of the church and replace it with a gifted speaker. Not that gifted speaker is not a part of the body of Christ and a gift to the body of Christ, but the body itself needs to be back in the center of the church. Because I've been dreaming about this, I've been praying about this, oh man, I would love it if one day in our country, here in the U.S., people understood the body of Christ, that they were just a part of it, and they got excited to gather and partake of the body and blood of Christ. And they celebrated together, and that's why we gathered. So, um, so all of this kind of came to a head, and, I, and naturally I started just talking to people here and there, sharing these thoughts with people here and there, and lo and behold, I discovered that a lot of people, a lot of people really, um, really find this question a, a real sore point. And um, in one of the uh, in one of the series that we do called Life One on One, we make a real point of talking about about this issue because we know that it's going to kind of stir the pot. Life One on One is all about discussions, but we know that it's gonna there's going to be people for and against. Is this indeed materially, substantially, the body and blood of Jesus Christ? on the altar. Is this the creator of the universe who has made himself into bread and put himself on the altar that he then would be the center of our gathering? Or is this symbolic or is it commemorative or is it so on? Today we're just introducing these questions. Historically, what does history have to say about this? And if there was a change in, in the common thought of people, if that is indeed true, if for the first 1500 and some years the entire Christian church believed something, well, why did people stop believing that? Historically, what happened? What were the pitfalls that were in that in there? And another point, if it is indeed true, if it is indeed true, then like, shouldn't there be like, like a Boxing Day stampede or like a, a Black Friday stampede? Or shouldn't there be like a stampede of people forcing themselves? In? Shouldn't we be like sheep trying to all get through a small door and we're all getting stuck, all trying to force ourselves in? If God Almighty is present, like, let me tell you a story, okay? Maybe some of you, some of you may or may not know this story. Back in the uh, end of the, uh, the fourth century and beginning of the fifth century, there was this beautiful, beautiful saintly man named Saint Pishoy. Saint Pishoy was a monk in the desert and he had a whole bunch of monks that were his spiritual children. And Jesus appeared to him in prayer and told him that he would appear on a mountain the following day. So, and, he, and, he, and, and, and Jesus told him, tell your spiritual children so that they can come and see me. 
So he told his spiritual children, everyone woke up early that next morning, and they were running up the mountain at daybreak. You know, as soon as the sun was up, they were they were out there, you know what I mean? And they were and they were running up, up that hill. And there was a little poor old man who asked every asked them, where, where, where are you all going? And they said, We're going up the mountain because our father Ava Peshoy said that the Lord Himself is going to appear. The Lord Himself will be present. And so he said, Oh, oh, I, I'm but I'm old and I can't make it up the mountain. Can can you help me? And they said, Look, we we'd really, we'd love to help you, you know, but but like, I mean, this is this is we'll help you up the mountain any other day. But this is this is a this is a once in a lifetime. This is a once in a lifetime thing, you know, right? And they're all whipping by him, right? And then Saint Pishoy sees him, and the old man says to him, says to him, I'm 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 too old to go up the mountain. And at this point, Saint Pishoy is he was also an old man. So Saint Pishoy says to him, I'll carry you. And he and he takes him and he's you know slings him over his shoulder, or puts him on his back or something, and he starts carrying him up the mountain and kind of remarks to himself at how light he is. This this frail little old man, I guess he's frail and, you know, poor and so maybe, you know, and then as he's going up the mountain, he gets getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And as, as at one point, St. Pashoy can't anymore, so he just puts him down and says, look, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't carry you, I'm not strong enough, but I tell you what, I'll wait with you here. You know, until and he turns and looks and he finds that it is the Lord Himself, right? But my point of this story is not about c compassion for those who can't. That's a really that's usually the main point of the story. But if some divine revelation happened to one of you that said that Jesus Himself would would be appearing at Saint Michael's Cathedral this afternoon, none of you all would be here. Right? You'd all be there, and so would I. We would put a sign on the front door, see you at St. Michael's Cathedral. Right? Isn't that what we would do? Another time, another story about another desert monk, St. Shenouda the Archmandite. This guy was a saint from like birth, practically. From when he was eight years old, his, he, he was, he was, uh, his hands would turn to flames every time he prayed. Right? Some people are just kind of, God has chosen them for a purpose, right? Anyhow, his disciple Abba Lisa would knock on the door at noon to bring him his to bring him his lunch, um, and so he knocks on the door and he hears him speaking to somebody. So he's like, he pauses and waits. He doesn't want to interrupt. He knocks again, and conversation carries on. So he just you know opens the door just a little bit to slide the food in, and he notices there's nobody there. So he says to him, Abba, who who are you speaking to? And he says to him, the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so Abuisa is like, what? <laughs> the Lord? He says to, he says to him, uh, Abuisa says to him, can I see him? Right? And, and St. Shinoda tells him, I don't think so. Matha <laughs> 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 Kitsch, like, um, fat chance. <laughs> Something along those lines. Right? <clears throat> and he says to him, it is enough for you to hear his voice, to be healed. Of all of your and from all of your sicknesses. So from then on, Abba Wisa sat at the door of Saint Shunda for the rest of his life. He would, didn't want to leave the door lest he would miss to hear the voice of Christ. So, and when you hear these things about these people, I'm sure you don't think that they are ridiculous. Like you would do the same. But it begs the question. Is, is Christ not here among us? If he is, then forgive me to be very blunt and honest. Why, why do I drag my feet to come? And if he isn't, well, let's get a fact straight. Like, if he isn't, like, okay, you know, we're here to, like, remember something really nice and something really important and it's good to remember it and to be to live in the continual remembrance of the sacrifice and the love of Christ, of his death, of his resurrection, to proclaim his death and his resurrection and his ascension to heaven and so on, right? 
but is it or isn't it? So in these coming weeks, we'll examine, in these coming weeks, we'll examine all of the evidence that we can kind of get our hands on. Historical evidence, some scientific evidence, uh, doctrinal evidence from scripture, from the early church fathers, and then also speak to to also speak to uh, the, 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 uh, the other side, right? And then Jesus says something which is oftentimes very difficult for us to understand. Jesus says to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this cup of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. So, is it a remembrance? Is it a memorial? Or is it the real thing? And if it is the real thing, why does Jesus say, do this in remembrance of me? Why doesn't he say, I don't know, something else, or have just omitted that, right? I encourage you, I encourage you in this week to look at John 6. You'll find in, in, in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus, um, it gives foundational teaching on, about what we call the Eucharist, about, about communion, about the, our, our liturgical life. And then also, if you look in 1 Corinthians 11, you'll find St. Paul also giving foundational principles. He says, as the Lord has taught me, and he speaks in the first, first person of the Lord, what the Lord Jesus Christ has taught, has, um, has taught him. Um, I'll leave you with, uh, uh, I'll leave you with two very brief quotes. And today's kind of short, it's just an introduction, it's just something to whet your appetite to kind of get us all on the same page and get us excited for what comes next. I'll leave you with one thought and, uh, and, and, and two quotes. Um, Saint, Saint John of Damascus says, if this is indeed his body and his blood, then one speckle, he says, one like, like, like not a crumb, like a speck of a crumb, is enough to bring healing to all the whole created world. You'll notice that if anything falls from the priest's hand, the deacons swoop in with 700 candles and like try to find, you know, the, we call it the gem that has fallen. Rather than calling it uh, the crumb, we we'll call it the gem that has fallen, right? Um, and so St. John of Damascus says, one, one speckle of the body of Christ is enough for the healing of the entire created world. Um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, he himself has said, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. Then who, who then should doubt? So we'll kind of like examine all of these things. <clears throat> The greater implication of all of this is, if this was indeed, like, this came into the service as bread and wine, and at the end of the service, at the end of the prayer, it became body and blood, then how did that, how did that happen? Well, a miracle has taken place. There's another miracle which also takes place during the liturgy, which is even more grand then God will transform himself into, God, into bread and wine. It is that he would transform himself into, into your body and into your blood. As Francis Chan was commenting, that in the early church and for decades and centuries, this, the most central thing in any gathering was the table. It was the table that was at the center. Not the pulpit, not the preaching. That was secondary. When you look at an icon, an Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox icon of the Last Supper, you'll notice that this, the table, you can only see the back half of the table. You see Jesus sitting and his disciples all around. And you see the table, but it, the rest of the table is cut off. You ever ask yourself why that would be? Some things are just by artistic license, but some things are intentional. If you see it by all different iconographers, it's always depicted that way. It must be on purpose. Our teaching is, is because 
in the liturgy, we are participating with Jesus in the Last Supper. We are not doing a new work. We don't pray like today is January 26, 2020, so we pray the liturgy on January 26, 2020, and we pray one on January 19, 2020, and we pray one on January 12th. No. We're, we're participating in one liturgy. There's about 25, 26, 24 Coptic Orthodox churches in the greater Toronto area. So how many Coptic Orthodox liturgies happen in the greater Toronto area today? Some churches have three or four or five liturgies a day. So how many liturgies happen today? One. We're all participating in the same one because Jesus sits at the head of the table, his disciples all around, and you and me sit around the other half of the table that is not depicted in the icon, but is right in front of you on the altar. Glory be to God forever and ever.